All right. Welcome back to the second episode of our live stream here. I'm answering all your questions. I know there's a couple people in the live chat, but we've got some more people joining here real soon. And if you do have questions, let me know and I will try to get to them and in the best order I possibly can. Last time went super well. Thank you for everyone who participated and uh, I'm super excited about today. So I'm um, still waiting for some questions to come in. Um, again, uh, my name is Scott Wilkinson. I'm a body piercer. I've been doing this since 1994. I own and operate a studio here in Las Vegas, Las Vegas, Nevada, anyways. And uh, my studio is about four years old. We've got tons and tons of jewelry here. Um, right now, we're appointment only. So if you were ever interested in coming to Vegas and getting pierced, make sure to set up an appointment because it's we're at least a couple days out. It's tough to get in. Um, but anyways, thanks again for tuning into my live stream. Oh, oh, and also, I need to say this, Jared Carl is behind the screen over here taking all your questions, so if you're talking to anyone online, you're, you're dealing with Jared, and that's the voice you're going to hear. Uh, we don't have a camera on him today. We're trying to still get things set up. Hopefully, we have a couple extra camera uh, camera views this time, see if we got one going. Hey, it still works. Look at this, and this is inside my piercing room here, too, so I just kind of want to give a slightly different type of a something for you guys to look at anyways i think we're gonna get started with a question here so jared hit me away with the first question all right scott we have a couple of questions that come from the youtube uh relating to tongue piercings sure so how long is the healing process on a tongue piercing and does it give you a permanent lisp well it shouldn't give you a permanent lisp if you take the jewelry out your tongue will go right back to normal and uh you shouldn't have any problems now as far as the healing process there's a kind of couple different stages on the tongue piercing first thing is you're going to be swollen on average from three to five days so you need to focus on keeping the swelling down the best you can for those uh first several days and the more you keep it down the faster and better it's going to heal for you now on average you're probably looking about six to eight weeks to be fully fully healed but what I suggest to my customers is generally like after like three weeks or so, you can downsize to a shorter post. We put that longer post in there to start off with. And if you downsize to the shorter post, once the swelling's gone down and it's pretty well healed up, that also minimizes any troubles and allows it to heal faster. So it's going to feel healed after about a month, but six to eight weeks is the average healing time for a tongue. Good question. Another question. If they take their tongue piercing out, do they have to worry about food getting stuck in the hole. I've never really heard of anyone taking the jewelry out and the food getting stuck in there. But I imagine if you had your tongue stretched all the way to a two gauge or a zero gauge and you have that huge hole in there, yeah, food will get in there. But a normal size, it really shouldn't. Um, the body is a pretty amazing thing. If something does get in there, your body will find a way to repel or you know expunge it right out of your tongue. So that's generally why the swelling and things happen is your body's trying to push it out. It's after a couple of days when it gives up with the jewelry. I'm not sure why it works that way, but three to five days is the average swelling time and as far as like things getting caught in there i've heard of people when they have jewelry in like maybe small doritos or chips sometimes get wedged in there i've never seen it personally but i've heard it but nothing to really worry about all right scott on the subject of tongue someone asked if they change the ball from metal to plastic does that mean they can play with it more absolutely not do not play with your tongue piercing um the thing is, is some of the plastic or the acrylic on some of the tongue barbells is almost as hard as your teeth. Some of it's dental acrylic. There's different grades of that plastic. First of all, it's not real great to wear plastic long term. Second thing is, is even if it's softer than your teeth and you're rubbing it up against the gums like the back, it's still going to get you gum erosion and you can do a lot of damage. So the biggest thing is shorten your bar to the appropriate size so you can't play with it and get rid of that habit right away. If you're going to play with it, just take it out because you're going to do damage. All right. We have a question from chat here from Tanya saying, I got my first cartilage piercing last week and my piercer used a curved barbell. I've mostly seen it done with rings. Should I be fine with a curved barbell? Um. Did it say what piercing it was or just cartilage? Cartilage. Okay, I'm just going to assume that that's a normal helix piercing up there. Um, typically, I pierce with a straight stud, not a curved barbell. It shouldn't make that huge of a difference unless your curved barbell is so long it's noticeably curved. Um, generally, you just want to have a little bit of extra room for swelling. So if you have a curve that's moving back and forth, that will cause problems. Now, it kind of falls into the same category as like getting pierced with a ring. If you get pierced with a ring, there's more movement, therefore they take 
way longer to heal. I highly suggest always getting pierced with a stud, but getting pierced with a long curve barbell, excuse me, getting pierced with a long curve barbell is almost the same thing as getting pierced with a, a ring. We've got a clarification. It's a doff piercing. Oh, it is a doff piercing. Okay. Yeah. Um, I only pierce with rings on those. I don't like the curve barbell. Now, the reason why is the curve is going to twist inwards and outwards. And when it twists in is when I see the huge bumps form. For some reason, the curve barbells don't work as well on the doth as the ring does. This is like one of the only exceptions where I always and only will pierce with a ring on there. I won't even use a curve barbell. Do you, is it something that she should be concerned about that she got pierced with a curve barbell or do you think she'll still probably heal all right? She still could heal all right. Um, you just got to keep your eye on it. If it's causing problems, I mean, if it's brand new piercing, I wouldn't change it out yet. You still can heal it without issues. But if you're a month into it, a month and a half, and you're starting to get bumps and starting to get irritated, it might not be a bad idea to change out to the ring. It's really hard to say it's it's person-to-person -person situation, but I like starting with rings as opposed to curved barbells. Here's an interesting question from Dome Slice. How do piercers network? Is it all online or like the tattoo world? Are there magazines or conventions to meet at? Uh, like hanging out in the world or underground type stuff? Like how do you guys hang out? Um, there's a lot of piercers, a lot of people in the body art industry who stay really enclosed in their own little world and don't seek anything out. Those are the people who don't continue their education and they're not really growing as piercers. Part of the reason why I'm at where I'm at is I started networking way back in the day. Before there was even the internet, I was going to different tattoo shops. I was pulling out the yellow pages saying, hey, I need to go visit these guys. And I'd walk in and say, hey, I'm a body piercer. I might, I've might i been doing it only for a year or two years. But I said, wonder if you have a piercer here. I can just kind of talk with them. We just kind of shoot, you know, shoot the gap back and forth until we kind of learn some things, possibly pierce each other eventually. Nowadays there's the internet. I mean, a lot of us are friends with each other. And if I had a question, I might hit someone up in uh, another state, someone who's more experienced in one way or another and uh, get their opinion on things. It's not bad to get multiple opinions. So you should be networking with the, all the social networking. It's, it's not too tough to do. Now, as far as the social gatherings, there are a few of them, different conventions and things like that. The big one is the association of professional piercers. That's hosted here in Las Vegas, and that's how I learned about Las Vegas. I started coming out here for all these conventions and loved it out here so much, I ended, I eventually just moved here. But that's the one convention. It's about a week long. It's really not geared towards just consumers, but it's more for piercers. It's classes and seminars, talking to doctors, surgeons, other industry professionals, seeing the new jewelry and styles. You have to have a lot of license, and they don't allow everyone in, but that's the one social place where everyone kind of hangs out. So that's the best answer I can really give to you. But yeah, it's all social media. Very cool. Uh, Chris J asks, he's considering getting a smiley piercing. What do you think in general? And does that require any specific anatomy? Absolutely. Um, the smiley piercing isn't anatomy dependent. And the smiley is that little web in between your gums and your lip. Um, when I have a customer come in, I'll do a little consultation with them and I have them kind of pull their lip out to make sure they have the web. Some people have just barely a thin, thin piece of skin there. And if it has to be enough to support jewelry, otherwise it's going to reject right out. Maybe a couple of weeks, maybe a month it would last if there's not enough tissue. And I'm brutally honest with my customers. Now, smiley piercings can do damage. You need to be careful to make sure it's not rubbing up against your teeth, causing gum erosion. So once it's healed up, if you end up getting it done, I highly suggest going to a real thin, not necessarily a thin, but a, like a clicker, something where there's not going to be beads and extra stuff rubbing up against your teeth and your gums. So keep your eye on it. It's a cool piercing. It's not very painful, but it can do damage if you're not careful. All right. Got another question about planning out a, a conch piercing. So they want to know how much planning does it take to plan out a triple conch? They'd like to get it pierced. And then when it heals, put a spiral hoop through it. So if you have a, a long-term plan, like a spiral, what, what do you really have to do to build up to that? Uh, there's a couple different ways you can kind of look into that. Typically when I've done the spiral piercings, like down helixes, I'm not sure if I've ever done, I might've done a double spiral on a conch, but I put the spiral in right away just because those, the bars are set at a certain angle. And when you put in other jewelry, sometimes they can migrate and adjust if you're laying on it or if your masks or if headphones are rubbing up against it, there's a lot of variables which can change the angle. So I want it to heal in the same angle I pierce with the jewelry in. It's a rough, rough heal. 
I, that's the way I would go about it. Now, a lot of times those spiral pieces of jewelry, you're going to want to get this in possibly a steel, a fully annealed steel, which means it's going to be bendable and flexible. So if you did separate piercings, you could adjust those angles, but you're going to have to find a piercer to work with and kind of tweak that ring until you do get it in the right position. It's going to be a long healing process. No matter what you're dealing with, minimum probably year, year and a half before it's even close to comfortable. It's a rough one, but beautiful. All right. Question from Fluffy. Uh, their piercer says that he doesn't recommend getting a doff and a septum done at the same time. Do you know why he would say that? Because he didn't respond when asked why. I really don't know. Um, I will turn people down for piercings if they come in and they have like maybe a, a, a cast on or they just got through a major operation. Um, there's certain variables or if they have a full sleeve and they're healing that up, like your body can only heal so much. Do you have other piercings you're healing or tattoos? Um, other than that, maybe the piercer was intimidated and it's, they're not that experienced and both septum and doth can be difficult piercings to do. And that might be a doozy for a, for a newbie. <laughs> that maybe that's about the only guess I would have, but typically I don't like to have more than like four or five piercings healing on a person at once. So if you had five piercings, you came in next week to get one more, I would say, no, we need to wait a little bit longer. When piercing nipples, do you suggest going straight across or angled? It's all personal preference. It's the look you are going for. Um, now, sometimes just a slight angle inwards can look really good, and that way you can still wear the ring if you want. If you're going more of a 45-degree angle, you would never be able to wear any sort of hoop, circular barbell of any sort. It's just the looks. Now, the only negative thing I would say about going more on the vertical route is sometimes taking shirts off or bras could get caught and lift up on the bottom of that bar, which can be pretty uncomfortable. I personally used to have vertical nipple rings, and that's the reason why I took them off. Every time I took my shirt off, it would grab and lift up from the bottom up, and not very comfortable. But it's personal preference. Um, the only other thing I would say about that is if you initially maybe had horizontal nipple piercings and they rejected all the way out, then you might need to do a, a slightly different angle just so there's better tissue to support it the second time around. All right. No boots for snake ass. <clears throat> hey, Scott, I've got a problem with my cartilage piercings. For example, an anti-helix. They never swell down. It's kind of healed. It doesn't hurt at all. And I still clean it every day and don't sleep on it. They seem to be indicating that it's staying swollen. Mm -hmm. It doesn't hurt. What do you think? There is an irritant somewhere. Sometimes when we sleep, we might be rolling over on it, not realizing it or even touching it in our sleep. Uh, masks can be a huge issue. If you still have to wear your mask, sometimes they will get caught and rub up against it. And just the littlest amount can be an irritation for it. So you gotta be careful with that. Uh, it could be hair products. Um, if your hair is getting wrapped in there. Um, and the, did they say how old the piercing was? Uh, well, I believe it is on the newer side, but that it's still just the swelling hasn't gone down. Okay. And they, they clarify that there's no bumps or anything. It's just swollen in general. Sometimes cartilage takes a long, long time to fully heal up. When I do a doth piercing on a customer, I'll tell them to take a picture after like maybe a couple of days or a week of the freshly pierced side and the non-pierced side. So you have a reference to kind of look. And then maybe in a couple months, you can take a picture and you can see how it slowly goes down. Typically, what I found is when cartilage when cartilage is fully, fully healed up is when the swelling is completely gone down. The only time you ever need to downsize a bar is when the bar turns into that antenna and starts moving around causing more issues. So sometimes it's several months, sometimes it's a couple of weeks. Every person's situation is different. Okay, we've got a question about how one becomes a piercer. Uh, how does one get into piercing as a profession? I've been wondering this for a few years and what would one look for in terms of training, et cetera? It's a really, really awesome question. And this is something that deserves almost an entire video. Other people have done videos on this, but it's ultimately who you're comfortable with and someone you have um, a relationship with almost. You know, like you've been pierced by them several times. You're comfortable with the way they do it. The, the problem is, is a lot of people will just like, I just need to get my foot in the door. And I, I kind of understand that. So you accept any apprenticeship, but... When you do that, you're learning a lot of bad habits, a lot of bad things, and you're compromising you're, you're compromising a lot of um, 
potential knowledge you could have gained and it's going to take you that much longer to learn because you have to backstep. So finding the right person to do the apprenticeship with, someone you feel comfortable with, someone who's not going to be too pushy on you, and you go at your own pace. It's really, really difficult to say who's a good and who's bad without knowing but use common sense. Look around. If it seems like things are getting reused, things are cross contaminated they're not changing their gloves, you should have a good idea if you want to be a piercer who's bad and who's not. So use your best judgment is the best thing I can really say on that one. So basically you're saying you need to get a hold of a, a, an established professional piercer and apprentice under them. There's no like piercing school the way I could go to say like accounting school Correct. or hairdressing school. There isn't a, an official. Good clarification. Yeah, there are seminars. There are certain things like the gauntlet, uh, which I attended. I don't think they're around anymore. The Fakir intensives. There's other classes and seminars. These are not apprenticeships. You need to seek out a full apprenticeship. So Finding that piercer, and it's going to take minimum six months, could take up to a couple years, depending on the situation, how busy the shop is, what things you're experiencing, and how fast you pick up and learn. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of different variables. But yeah, there's no quick, easy route. It's finding someone you trust, someone who's knowledgeable and has been doing it a long time. Someone who's been piercing for two years or a year and a half, it's probably not a good person to uh, teach you how to pierce. You need some time under your belt. Excellent. Okay, we have this question here. Uh, hi, Scott. I repierced my lobes and stretched them the same day to double zeros two months ago, but they had to take them back out the same day. Now they're healed up and they're wondering if they can get it repierced and restretched. So are they saying they pierced large right away and stretched right to? Yes, pierced large, went straight to a double zero, but then for whatever reason, complications or whatever, had to sure, remove sure. it immediately and heal it up. Okay. Chances are there's probably a lot of scar tissue in there. That would be the first thing I'm going to say is make sure that the, the lobe tissue feels as close to normal as possible. Um, with that, you might want to seek out some sort of scar tissue remover. If it does feel kind of lumpy or you can feel those bumps because you can break it down. Like back in the day, I used to have stretched earlobes. And when my earlobes were, were removed, they were cut off and burned shut. Um, they were like hard, nasty scar tissue. So um, basically... Rubbing that massage, uh, rubbing that um, scar tissue remover in there, um, breaking that down every single day is the best bet. Yes, you could get it done. The better you make your earlobes first, the better off they're going to look overall. And it might take several months before you can get it repierced. Excellent. Hope that helps. I wish I could get my earlobes pierced again ever since that. There's nothing left there. Okay, what's the best jewelry option for a philtrum piercing to avoid as much damage to the gums and teeth as possible? Um, when I do a philtrum piercing, I am going to be using a labrette, and there are many different lengths which I will use. It depends on your anatomy. Um, you're going to overswell, so it has to be long to start off with. I like to use a four millimeter disc on the inside. It seems to work really, really well. Anything really a lot smaller than that can get sucked into the lip. So I don't like to go too small and anything bigger could be obtrusive and rub up against the gums or that frenulum on the upper part of your lip. So start off with the long post. I generally do a 16 gauge. If you wanted to do larger, I can go up to a 14 or a 12 but 16 gauge labrette and then downsize to that shorter post. That is the key to not doing all the damage. And also for the next month while you're healing everything up, eat slower, take your time and be aware of it. When we let our guard down is when we're playing with it, we might bite down and actually do the damage. So downsize your jewelry and be very careful during the healing process. That's the best advice I could give. Excellent. So, all right, we have a question here from Sir Gloomy. They got, uh, a vertical industrial done right before the pandemic started and they ended up getting a cart hematoma, like a cauliflower ear. Mm -hmm. uh, have you seen that happen a lot? Is that a common occurrence? Cause you do see it a lot with wrestling. Is that something that piercings cause? It has happened in the past and I have seen this. It's disturbing. And for a long while, I didn't actually like doing industrials and things like that on minors just because of this possibility of, you know, the, that overgrowth, the hematoma and so forth. Um, it can be treated. A lot of times it does get better, but it's always a possibility. Cartilage is a, a tricky area. It's a tough heel. Um, I wish I knew what really caused all that to, to, to happen that way. It's not super common, but it can happen. Excellent. Yeah. CJ asks, is a tongue web piercing dangerous? The only true danger 
is going to be losing a bead and biting down and chipping your teeth. Um, if they're piercing that far into the gland, like yeah, that could be dangerous, but typically when you're looking at your tongue web, it should be real thin tissue. I like to tell people you should be able to take like a flashlight and almost have light go through it. So there's nothing really dangerous about it. Now, when I originally had mine done, I played with mine a lot. I don't suggest you do that, but I ended up stretching mine all the way up to a four gauge. Once we were up to the four gauge, I had this really, really thin thin piece of skin there and I ended up just cutting it because it was just so even after all of that trauma I still don't have any problems with my tongue and everything seems to be working really really well so yeah um really not much of a risk other than uh the beads bite down so check your beads make sure they stay tight so okay Lauren says hey man I had my septum pierced late in late May how long would you recommend I wait until I change it to a full round hoop instead of a horseshoe bar thanks man Absolutely. Uh, for this, this one, you're going to want to probably wait six to eight weeks minimum. Your piercing needs to be healed. And if it seems like you just got rid of the crusties the day before, don't change it the next day. Give it a couple weeks. So typically the septum piercing is going to feel comfortable after maybe three or four weeks, maybe a month and a half. That's why I say two months before you actually change it out. And if it's red or sore or doesn't seem healed, wait longer. Changing it out is not going to help the situation. All right, we have another question here. How much time does it take for a cheek piercing to heal? And once it's healed and you take the jewelry out, is it sure that the dimple will stay? Good, good question. Cheek piercings are a pain in the butt to heal. Um, typically when we do cheek piercings, um, I'm using almost like an inch, inch and a quarter bar to actually accommodate all the room for the swelling. Sometimes you can downsize after uh, a couple months. Sometimes it's six months. Sometimes it's a full year before you actually downsize because they swell and fluctuate so much. So for cheeks, I'm going to say six months to a year to fully, fully heal them. And you can bite down on those posts. You can bite down your cheeks because it's swollen. You just got to be careful. They're a tough one to heal. Now, as far as taking out and leaving a dimple, it depends on the person. Every person scars completely differently. For me, I doubt I would leave any sort of scar. My eyebrows have been done maybe a dozen plus on each side. I can't tell you how many lip piercings, how many, and I just don't leave scars. So I probably wouldn't have much of a scar. Actually, now that I think about it, I've had cheek skewers probably a couple dozen times where it's like 14 gauge rods and we just put them through when I was doing like performances like suspensions or energy pulls but I don't have any sort of scar from that. So there's no guarantee, but it's a possibility. Um, sometimes also, you can also have that discoloration from that fistula or that scar tissue, which can, which can give the look of the dimple and not necessarily being the full actual dimple. Another question about uh, frequency of piercings. How much time should I leave between piercings? Two or three weeks ago, I got three piercings and two of those are cartilage. Is it okay if I go and get three, a few more? in two or three weeks with a max of like three. It sounds like that was like five piercings. If you already had three and you want to add two or three more, that might be quite a bit. Now, one thing to keep in mind is, did you get all these on one side of your ear or was it both sides? Because if you get them all on one side, that leaves one ear to sleep on and makes healing much, much nicer. Now, if you're going both sides, you don't have that side to sleep on and you might be trapped on your back or your face for probably six months to maybe a year. Typically, I don't like to have more than five or more piercings healing at once because the healing length of time gets extended. The more piercings you get, the weaker your immune system gets, and the longer they take to heal, the longer there are open wounds, and the more problems you could have. So if you're trying to heal three or four right now and they're giving you problems, wait a little bit longer. Otherwise, if they seem like they're going good and you can sleep in the condition I was telling you, whether it's on your back or your face, go for it. But like I said, five, six max, probably closer to five. What do you recommend for a tongue piercing, titanium or stainless steel? I'm always going to suggest going with the titanium just because there's a possibility of having a nickel allergy, developing a nickel allergy, and really no one's allergic to it. Now, the other nice thing about the titanium is they can be anodized, which means you can color them, change um, the look of it, and they're lighter weight. So sometimes that lightweight can actually make a nice difference because if you have a large bead on your tongue and that steel, it'll kind of create a little bit of a dimple. Sometimes if you have the titanium, the lightweight isn't going to create the dimple on the top the same way. 
Okay, CJ says that uh, their ears were pierced as a child, but they never wear earrings in them because everything irritates them. But I got an upper lobe piercing done as an adult and it healed perfectly and never gets irritated. Why do the old piercing holes bother me, but not the new ones? I see this type of thing quite a bit. Um, the thing is, is chances are you're not leaving your jewelry in long enough. If you put a normal earring stud, because you just assume that it's healed and there's like a butterfly back, it's not the appropriate size. It's pinching on your ear. And if you don't wear the earrings all the time and you just put it in, you're stretching your piercing. So when you stretch your piercing, it's going to be sore, irritated for maybe a day or a couple days. So what I suggest doing is putting in a flat back, like a labrette, something like small disc on the back, and then put that titanium post in there and leave it in there for several days. After several days, your ear is going to relax. You'll be able to sleep on it right away, and you'll be able to start wearing earrings on a more regular basis. Now, some people can leave piercings out and they stay open. Sometimes they start shrinking right away. You might be the type of person where when you take it out, they start shrinking right away. So the more you keep jewelry in, the more comfortable it's going to be. Okay. Anna asks, hi, I had my septum pierced a month hi, and a Anna. half ago. It's cur it's a curved bar, so I'm going to change it in a few weeks. But what size do you recommend me to buy? I cannot tell you the size without seeing your actual septum. Um, typically, septum piercings can wear 5 sixteenths of an inch, 3 eighths, sometimes even up to like 7 sixteenths or half. Depends on how high up your septum is. When I do the piercing, I actually clean it and I'll, I'll stick my pinkies in there and feel where it's at and I find the appropriate spot. So I don't force the jewelry to fit the area. I find the jewelry to fit that area. So, Excellent. Yeah. Uh, another interesting question. Is it possible to get a philtrum and a smiley or would they tangle up on the back? It is possible. Everyone's anatomy is different. Now, if you don't have a real long upper lip and that uh, the smiley, the web comes down far, they might get intertangled a little bit. Now, there's always the possibility of like maybe doing a circular barbell in the smiley. So you have that little gap. And if it does, it's not going to get caught like a ring would. Um, also, if you have a longer lip, sometimes that, that philtrum or medusa is lower on the lip high enough where they don't even touch. I did one recently where they don't touch and they looked fantastic together. But again, it's an anatomy dependent thing and depends on what your lip looks like and if it would support it. Okay. Ziggy has a question. It's a standard question, but it never hurts to talk about it more. Uh, they just got their septum pierced thanks to your video and they have their tragus newly pierced. What's the best way to clean both of them? Awesome. Aftercare question. Almost every aftercare pierce or every piercing is going to want to use a wound wash spray, which is sterile saline solution inside a can. There's many, many versions that you can get. And the best ones, in my opinion, are the fine mist ones. You know, like squirt bottles, sometimes you have the full stream and you have the like the gentle mist. The gentle mist is what you want. Now, the one we use here is Neil Med. And what it suggests is hold it like two to three inches away from your piercing, just a quick squirt on both sides so it gets wet. And then what you want to do is take a paper towel or a piece of clean gauze and roll it up into a point to wipe off crusties. They should soften up and just wipe right off there. And if they're not wiping off, give it a little bit more time so they do just wipe off. All right. And it sounds like one of my cameras just went down. Awesome. Uh -oh. All right. Yeah, it did. Yep, it went uh down. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, okay. So, and then as far as like oral piercings go, you you don't want to use the wound wash spray on the inside of your mouth. You'd only use it on the outside of your lip if that was the case. Oral piercings are going to be using a mouthwash that's alcohol-free to clean the inside. As far as the outside piercings, we also don't suggest using any sort of soaps. If soaps get inside the piercing, it's going to prolong the healing process. It can be a little irritating. Now, I'm not suggesting not to use soap. Clean around the area. Don't get soap inside the piercing. So uh, wound wash spray once a day is generally enough. And keep the area clean. Keep your dirty hands off. That's the toughest part. Now, this kind of relates to Good a luck, question yeah. that we got earlier in the stream asking about what was that oil that you recommend for irritations and yeah. what brand? Because they've looked it up and there's a bunch of different brands. How do they know which one to get? Um, Emu oil is the name of the product. Uh, and it's Emu Ranch. I believe it's in Arizona. I really don't remember off the top of my head. Um Next live stream video next week, I will have some here and I will actually show you guys what it actually is. 
Um, I'm sorry, I don't have it right now though. But yeah, it's emu oil. Um, they come in like little tiny little bottles and you just put the smallest dab on there and it really calms and soothes things out. Like when I had my doth piercing, there was a lot of crusties, a lot of irritation bumps. As soon as I went to that, within a couple of days, it started feeling better for me. I've sworn by it for over 20 years. It's a great product. And again, it's the only oil that I ever really suggest putting on the piercing. Now, when you read their pamphlet, it does say you can use it for the aftercare. I cannot testify to that. I've never used it as an aftercare product. I've only used it when there's been problems and it's been amazing for that. So um, next week I'll, I'll bring a product and I'll show you exactly what it is, but it's, I believe they're in Arizona or New Mexico and it's Emu Ranch something. Yeah. Sorry, wish I had a better answer. All right. Cool. So I had my tragus done over a year ago, asked Crystal, but recently it's been irritating and itchy and getting crusty. What should I do? And I have a very small tragus. Okay. First thing I would say is that you change the jewelry recently, because if you change the jewelry, sometimes it's the quality of the metal, the size of the jewelry, um, maybe new earphones, earbuds, things that are going or touching your ear. That could be a, a factor. Um, how have you been feeling? Sometimes if you're getting sick, piercings can swell up and get a little extra irritated. You just kind of want to be, that might be a possibility. So, and then the last thing would be is if you caught it on something, like if you're drying off for a shower or bath and you caught a towel and yanked on it, it's going to get sore and irritated. Sometimes we do these little irritations and we don't even realize we do it. And then days later, we just notice the after effects of it. So the best thing to do is if it was bleeding or anything like that, you could use some wound wash spray, just like that aftercare I was just going over. Otherwise, just try to leave it be and it should go back to normal. If you did change your jewelry and the jewelry is what's causing the problem, change back to the other original style if that is the case. But generally, after a couple of days, if you leave it alone, it should go back to normal. They do act up once in a while. Okay, we have a question here. Uh, hello, can I change a hoop in my helix to a thicker one without damage? For example, I want to change jewelry from 0.8 millimeters to 1.2 millimeters. Is that going to be okay? It really depends on how long you've had your piercing. Um, it was a helix piercing, correct? Uh, hoop in my helix, yes. Yeah, okay. Now, with the hoop, the hoop's going to be moving around, and therefore, it should be a little bit looser inside. There it should be an easier stretch. Now, if you've had your piercing for six months, maybe 12 months, or even longer, the longer you have it, the easier the stretch will be. Now, when you stretch cartilage, and I've done it before, it kind of sucks. Uh, if you do it and it's tight, it's going to be sore and tender for weeks before it generally goes back to normal. If you do this and you're patient and it doesn't move around, you can heal this up. But if you have a ring in there and that's spinning and rotating and it's that extra tight, it's going to be a problem. So might be a good idea to stretch with the stud or a plug, not the actual ring. Um, Use your own judgment. Like if if you pulled out on your earring right now and you can see almost a little light or a little gap in there, you're probably ready to do it. But if it doesn't even spin when it's dry, I would wait a little bit longer. Sometimes they stretch easy. Sometimes they don't. Question about preferences. What's your favorite piercing to do? Um, I love doing septum piercings. I don't necessarily say it's my exact favorite piercing to do because I enjoy the personal experience back in the room more than anything. But if I had a favorite, I would say probably a septum just because they're a little bit more challenging than most other piercings. And the reason I say that is number one, it's tough to see where the actual piercing is going. So I'm laying down so I can look up their nose and there's two separate angles you need to hit more accurately than other piercings. For instance, an eyebrow just needs to hit the right angle this way. But for a septum, it needs to be level this way and level that way, which can be tricky to do. Um, a lot of piercers dread them, but I've been piercing long enough where it's, I feel like I've got it pretty good. I'm not 100% perfect. I do get a crooked piercing once in a blue moon. And generally, if you hit that septum, it's not very painful. It's an easy re-pierce. Uh, not very often that happens, but it's always a any septum. So keep that in mind too. Melissa Angel says, hi, Scott. I got my nostril pierced with you on July 27th. Thank you. Can I come in to get my septum or should I wait a little longer? Um, as long as your nostril's not too painful, yeah, we can totally re-pierce re you. But keep in mind that I have to use a receiving tube and it's going to be pressing up against there. So if it's sore or a little irritated, it might be a good idea to wait. But if it's not sore, yeah, let's do it. 
Sir Gloomy asks, how far ahead do you accept bookings for piercings? Uh, they'd love to meet you and support your craft one day. Awesome. Um, our calendar goes out quite a bit. We can do several months. Um, yeah, so the best thing to do is just uh, call the shop. You can set up an appointment, or if you know a certain time you're coming in, we can set aside that time for you, and we'll make that happen. So um, if you want to call and make an appointment at the shop, uh, please don't make appointments if you're not going to come here because no call, no shows means people have to wait longer for their piercings too. So be generous about it. But uh, the number is 702-749-3154. That's my shop number. And we'll put that down in uh, the description below. So if you ever want to come in, book your appointment ahead of time. Um, talk to me. We'll figure out what you want. And if it's an anatomy dependent piercing, like, you know, if it's a certain like forward helix or something, you can always take a picture and we can take a look at that. Um, to make sure that you're getting what you want and we have that time set aside for you. Another thing to keep in mind is if you come to Vegas and you want to get pierced by me, there's a lot of things to do here in Vegas. Sometimes it's not the best thing to do is the first piercing right away because if you're going to be going out, you're going to be partying, if you're going to be drinking, if you're going to be going in pools and hot tubs, uh, all these things are factors and this has to be part of your healing process. So I know it's good to watch it over a couple of days, but keep in mind, what are you doing while you're here in Vegas? And if it's at the end of the trip, that's what most people do. It seems to work out the best. Great question. Thanks. I'm excited to pierce you someday. All right. So we have a question here. Can you have a septril and septum jewelry in at the same time? Yes, you can. Um, Emily, uh, who I just pierced her septral, is actually wearing the clicker in there right now with the septum while it's healing. We've been watching it, and her septral is healing really, really smoothly. It's not sore. She's had the rings in there. I've, I've asked her about it. Now, just the other day, she said it's a little bit sore on one side, and she thinks it's because of the way the ring was sitting in there. Um, and I told her, I said, if it's causing problems, we got to take those rings out. But for the most part, everything's healing really, really smooth and really, really good. And it's been, I think she said, three weeks since we've pierced it. So, And she said no pain ever since the piercing either. So that's awesome. Have you done any third eye piercings? Uh, our viewer here got one yesterday and it won't stop bleeding, Lowell. Okay. Sometimes piercings bleed. Are we talking a dermal anchor or are we talking a surface bar? Um, that'd be the first question I would have. And if it is bleeding, you're going to want to take a piece of gauze or paper towel, roll it up into a point and apply pressure five to 10 minutes. Don't hurt yourself, but get enough pressure where it'll stop bleeding and no peaking. If you keep opening, it's going to start the healing or start the bleeding again. And then you have to hold it for another five to 10 minutes. So five to 10 minutes, set that timer and carefully pull it away. And that should stop any bleeding. When you get new piercings, sometimes they can bleed up to a couple days afterwards. It's not the end of the world, but if it's past that, you should probably talk to your piercer then. Did they say if it was did you see anything, Jared? Uh, I have not had a response. Not yet. a response yet. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's how third. Sometimes they, they can bleed. There are little veins and capillaries, but it's not the end of the world. Just apply pressure and it'll stop the bleeding. Esther asks, Hey, man, really enjoy your videos. I have Thank a you. doth that's healing at the moment. When will I be able to change it to a hoop with a smaller diameter? I don't want to do it too early. Is that possible? Yes, it is. Um, most everyone has a camera phone. I'm assuming you only have one doth, not both sides. And if that is the case, take a picture of both your doth, doths, doths. Yeah, that's a tough one to say. And that way you can compare the swelling. If the swelling's gone all the way down, you're able to downsize to the smaller ring. If it still looks twice the size of your other doth, you got some more healing to do. Everyone right. heals at a different rate. Yeah, I wish I could say an exact answer, but it's never an exact answer. But Three to six months, probably minimum. Okay, so Kingston got their earlobes pierced a few years ago, and since then, the piercing closed, but it scarred weird. Is it still possible to get their ears stretched out if they have some scar tissue in there? Yes, it is. You can still get them pierced and stretched out or whatever you need to do. Um, it, it's scarred weird. So uh, did they, does that mean they closed their piercing and they want to get them re-pierced? Yeah, it sounds like the piercing closed but left some odd scarring. Just want to know if there would be a problem with uh, Okay getting them stretched back out there again you're going to want to get some sort of a scar tissue remover the stuff i like is called mederma um but there's other brand names too and you're just going to kind of rub that in there now the thing is is if you have some weird scarring on there i'm guessing some discoloration maybe some growth or something like that you want to get your earlobe to look as normal as possible first 
Now, when I used Mederma and I had my earlobes removed, like they were burned shut. So like there was a lot of discoloration and I, I saw a noticeable difference within a week or so, but they do suggest using it up to six months to get the full effect. This will soften any of the scar tissue on there, bring their skin tone color back to close to a normal tolerable or a normal vi visible level. And then you should be able to get it re-pierced. If you did it right now, the discoloration, if there's any from the scar tissue, will stay there, and you're going to have all that scar tissue, which is tougher to stretch. So break down that scar tissue first, then get it re-pierced. All right. I got another question about someone that got their snug pierced a week ago, and the swelling is very bad. I <laughs> use the sterile saline, and I don't sleep on it. Is this normal? Yes. The snug is a rough one, and it's going to swell a lot. Um, I generally tell people it's going to be almost twice the size. If your beads are getting sucked into your piercing, that is too much. Um, you're going to want to get the swelling down, like ibuprofen, Aleve, Advil, or even soaking your ear in some cold ice water to kind of get that swelling down right away. If the beads are getting sucked in, you should go talk to your piercer and get a longer bar put in. Um, they should have started you with a long bar right away, but sometimes we do overswell. And then once the swelling has gone down in three to six months, then you can put that shorter post in there. But yeah, they swell a lot. Okay. okay. Um, recently took my nose stud out for a second to clean it, and I couldn't put the nose screw back in due to the curve and ended up stretching my piercing downwards. Any advice for what I should do? If you got the jewelry back in, I mean, just kind of stretching the jewelry downwards, that means you might have ripped it a little bit? Maybe. Maybe I don't know. Um Typically, when you're removing jewelry, you want to have some sort, get it lubricated, whether it's wet and it's, so it moves back and forth and you're able to take it out and have the new one to put in there right away. If you can't get that normal one in there right away, sometimes just taking a normal earring stud, the kind of like with a butterfly back, don't use the butterfly back, but put that in there because it's a straight pin and it's easier to find the piercing hole. Um, once the swelling has gone down and you relax a little bit, because I'm sure you go into panic mode because that's what we all do. Once you're calmed down, then you can take that out and carefully put in the new one. Again, just lubricate it, whether it's some soap and water. Um, just make sure it moves freely, easily. And as far as like if it's irritated, if it did rip and it bled a little bit, you probably want to use that wound wash spray, heal it up. But if it came down too much of a weird angle, that's where it's going to heal. If you don't like it, you might need to let it close up and get it repierced. Hope that helps. Trolled Guard says, Yo, Scott, I'm starting training as a piercer soon. Are there any things to be extra cautious about or maybe common mistakes you see in new piercers? Yes, yes. First of all, congratulations on becoming a piercer in your apprenticeship. Um, be aware of your surroundings. There's a lot of things you're not going to want to be touching and playing with, and your guard gets down real easily, and that's when it becomes dangerous. Being a piercer can be dangerous because of needle sticks. You're dealing with bloodborne pathogens, dirty tools. I don't know what your piercing situation is. Some shops are completely disposable. Some reprocess tools. Um, and that's what you need to be careful of. Make sure that the needles are being disposed of in the proper areas. You, you're aware of your surroundings. You're not cross-contaminating and, and touching the wrong things. So other than that... Um, common sense. If it doesn't seem right, question it, you know, because not every piercer is a good piercer. I hope you trust your piercer and I hope it's a good apprenticeship for you. Um, things to watch out for. That's it. Don't overstep your boundaries. If it doesn't seem safe, don't do it. Just baby steps until you get to where you need to go. I've seen a lot of people go through apprenticeships where they're doing industrials right away and orbitals and all kinds of crazy stuff. And Start with the basics, learn to walk before you run, and uh, understand your aseptic technique, your cross-contamination, um, the different levels of cleanliness. There's a lot of variables, and hopefully your, your peership will teach you all those things. Good luck to you. All right. A question from Kai. Kai, we didn't miss you. Uh, I really want <laughs> snake bites. Uh, are there something that you'd recommend at all? Plus, they mentioned that they have very thin lips. Do you think that that would present any problems or... No, it's generally no problems if you have a thinner lip, less tissue to pierce, faster to heal. Um, 
when you get initial piercings, we have to give room for any of that swelling. And then after the swelling's gone down, just downsize to that short post that fits. Now, if you have thin lips, a lot of piercers think like, oh, you downsize to this specific size. It's like pants. You find the size that fits you. There are many different lengths. Find the jewelry that fits. That's my best advice. And have fun getting pierced. All right. We have a viewer here who fell off the stairs today and hit their nipple piercings. Should they be worried about bumps? Um, worried about them? No, they're probably going to show up for a little bit if you hit them really good. I've been there before. They will get better. It's just when nipples get irritated, they start creating extra crusties. And with uh, bars or rings, they start spinning. You pull the crusties in, and it's just a re-irritating type of a thing. So if you start getting the crusties, start cleaning them again, keep them off there. Try not to spin or rotate it. And hopefully within a couple of days to a week or so, it'll go back to normal. If the crusties keep forming and keep scratchy, irritating, that's when the bumps happen. So keep it clean. All right. We have a question for you here. How many piercings do you have or have you had? Ooh, two completely different questions. Um, currently right now, I probably have 18 to 20 ish. I'm not a hundred percent. It's somewhere right around there. And it's how many have I had a lot, a lot's a ridiculous answer, but I stopped counting over 10 years ago when I was well over 400 at that point in time. So I bet I've been pierced 450 and that's piercings with jewelry in. That's not talking play piercings, cheek skewers, suspensions, energy poles. I've been pierced a lot. Like, yeah, see eyebrows 12 times, nipples six to 10 times each. Can't tell you how many Madison's my throat piercings I've had. Yeah. A lot. Good question. All right. I like getting pierced. <laughs> <laughs> Alexandre has had their helix pierced for one week. When is it going to be ready to put in a ring? When it's fully healed up. It's between three months and a year. It's a huge window, but it depends on whether those masks are getting caught, your hair products get in there, you're not touching and playing with it. If it's you know using the right healing products, it's a lot of variables. Take care of it good, and I would say three to six months. If you're kind of slacking on the aftercare, expect, expect six months to a year. Sophie asks if smiley piercings are temporary and says, love your videos. Thank you for watching my videos. Um, for the most part, I'm going to say smiley piercings are a temporary piercing. I have seen people wear them long, some people long-term, but over time you could get the gum erosion. I would say... The smiley piercings, similar to a tongue piercing, where it's one of the quicker ones that most people retire. Maybe a couple of years people have it, and then they kind of move on from it. It's not to say that it could be permanent, because it's a possibility. I just don't know if I've seen one much longer than a couple of years. Another viewer asks if it's true that every septum piercing will grow out with time. No, that is not true at all. Um, if the septum is pierced properly, I don't see any way it could reject out or grow out. Now, what I mean by that is a normal piercing here, like the skin is, if I lift up on it and I let go, the skin goes down and that would push out on the piercing. That's why piercings reject because there's not much of a ridge. Now, with your septum, it's thick cartilage, thin septum and then thick cartilage. We're going above the cartilage in that thin spot so it's resting on there. There's no way that would get thin and reject all the way out. Now, the only reason a septum would reject out is if the piercer pierced you way too low through all the cartilage in the bottom and you can almost see where the piercing hole is. Those probably will reject, but I think you would know if you had that piercing because they would be extremely painful. So then I'm sorry if you had one of those. Okay, we have a, a viewer who lives in Denmark and has difficulty obtaining all the different products that we have. They want to know if it's okay to rinse their helix piercing with salt water or chlorine. I would say probably no on the chlorine. Yeah, you're right on the chlorine. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the salt water is the best method um, next to the wound wash spray. The whole concept with the wound wash spray is it's a factory making the sterile saline mixed perfectly. And when you're spraying it out of the bottle, nothing contaminant can go back inside the bottle to cause it to be not sterile anymore. Now, when you're mixing up your own salt water, it's important that it's mixed properly. And generally, it's about a fourth of a teaspoon, um, basically just a pinch of salt, 
per eight ounces of water. Now you're gonna want the water to be distilled or filtered or as clean as possible. And then the salt needs to be non-iodized sea salt to mix, to match that, that saline mix that our body's made up of. A lot of times we mix it too strong, we get lazy, we don't mix it um, with the measuring spoons, measuring cups, and that's where we get into trouble. Also, you don't you want to mix it each time you use it. Don't mix it into a big bottle and store that bottle because bacteria stuff is going to grow in there. It's not going to be the right mixture, and it's just going to cause more problems. So if you need to do the sea salt water mix, you mix it individually each time you use it and mix it properly. The other option would be is if you have access to a normal saline solution. Sometimes hospitals, a wound wash spray, uh, most pharmacies will have a version of this. So wound wash spray is your best bet. If you don't have that, the non-iodized sea salt water soaks can work. Um, again, if you're doing the salt water soaks, you need to mix this into a clean cup too. Don't use a dirty cup. A lot of people will also use like plastic cups and the plastic can mix in there with it. There's so many variables that can go wrong with it, but it can be done right. So if you're going to do it, mix right, the right materials, and good luck to you. Lucy's going in on Saturday to get her nipples pierced. She says she's very nervous. And do you have any advice on what to do beforehand or how to help with the pain? Yes. Yes. Nipple piercings are always a scary one to walk in for. It's probably one of the scariest piercings to get because we've all been pinched or bitten really hard and it's not that bad. I've said it before, surrender to the experience. They're going to get done. The more relaxed you are, the easier it's going to be for you. Maybe if you bring a friend with you, someone who you trust and can be a good support team, someone who's going to hold your hand if you need a handheld or just to be calm and be there for you. Also, the night, excuse me, the night before, a good night's sleep, good proper rest will make a huge, huge difference. And sometimes carving out the night before, having some carbs in your system is a natural pain reliever. The big thing is, is try not to tense up, focus on your breathing, and surrender to the experience. It's worth it. It's not as bad as you expect. So another viewer got their nose pierced about five weeks ago and want to know if they could take it out just for a couple minutes. I wouldn't. Sometimes it's, that's all it takes for them to close up. You should try to keep jewelry in there all the time. Some people, I know it's not fair, but can get their nose pierced and then maybe take it out and 10 years later, it just goes back in. Some of us will have our nose pierced for 10 years. We take it out, and a couple minutes later, it's tough to get back in. You don't know who you are until it happens. So I would suggest leaving jewelry in there all the time. I don't know why you would need to take it out. Some people think they need to take it out to clean the jewelry, and that's not necessary at all. If you use that wound wash spray, all the crusty should just wipe right off that jewelry. Your jewelry should have enough of uh, a polish on there where stuff isn't going to stick to it that bad. So yeah, try to keep jewelry in there. And if you just, if you're taking it out to go shopping for jewelry, don't do that. Just have the jewelry ready. So take it out, new one goes in and you won't have any problems. Keep jewelry in there. All right. We have a question about septum piercings and the different shapes of noses. Do you feel like septum piercings are more flattering on particular noses than others? And do you think it would be a flattering option for someone with a bulbous nose, large or round nose? Yeah. Um, Everyone's nose is different. Now, the only time I ever really see it being a problem is if you have a really deviated nose and it's off to the side. Now, the reason being is like a lot of people will look at your whole face as a whole and they look at your upper lip. And if your ring for your septum is not over that center spot of your lip and it's off to the side, it's going to accentuate and make it look more crooked. So that's something to keep in mind. If your nose is coming off to the side, that ring's going to be further off to the side and make it look that way. Now, as far as having a more bulbous nose, I have more of a rounder nose. I, for myself, I didn't like my nose piercings until I had bigger jewelry in there. So it's finding the right style of jewelry, whether it's stretched, thinner, bigger diameter, smaller, a clicker, a certain color, it's finding the jewelry that fits you and works with you. So I don't think other than having a, a crooked septum or deviated septum would be the only issue where I wouldn't do it. There was one other case, one other case where a person had such small nostrils, the receiving tube barely fit inside their nose and I, I couldn't even get the jewelry in there to feel where it was at. And that's one of the only few times I've denied them because 
that a straight septum, but just I couldn't work with the anatomy. Yeah. Ben wants to know if you have your septum pierced. Yes, I do. Um, with my anatomy, my nose, my plugs get in the way of my septum piercing. So I don't wear my septum jewelry anymore. I originally had it stretched all the way up to a zero, which looked really cool. But with my nose plugs and the zero gauge, I had a tough time breathing out of my nose. And well, breathing is important. So I took that one out. And then the other issue is with my plugs in my nose, when I wore my septum rings, it pushed the plugs out further and distorted my nose. And I didn't like the look of it. So I love having my septum pierced, but I just don't wear jewelry in it anymore. Okay. We've got a couple questions here about stretched earlobes. Uh, people really interested in doing it, but kind of scared about the aftermath. Like if years later they want to remove it, are they going to be left with a ragged hole? Uh, you know what I mean? Something unattractive. Is that, can that be reversed? Is it going to heal up? Yes. Yes. And that brings up something. I have a video coming out soon. Um, I don't know if you saw my last one, but I interviewed my friend Andy and we both had large earlobes and we actually had our earlobes removed and brought back to normal. We had different methods and we talk about that in the video. So coming up in the next couple of weeks, we'll probably release that video so you can see what that one's all about. But as far as the piercing goes, if you normal earlobe piercing like a 16 gauge or an 18 gauge to start off with you can stretch generally all the way up to a zero gauge maybe a double zero and that's what i consider the point of no return past that your ears won't shrink all the way back to a normal looking level now there's a couple exceptions here number one if you overstretch your ears and you stretch too fast it rips and tears creating more scarring and it won't shrink back up if you stretch it properly, which should take, you know, a month and a half to two months between each one size, then you should be able to get up to a zero gauge in roughly a year-ish or so, maybe a little longer, depending on how your ears do, and they will shrink back up. Now, if you're really, really concerned about it, you probably shouldn't be doing it, but that's what I suggest as far as the point of no return. Now, beyond that, surgeons uh, can actually fix up your ears. There's certain body modification artists who will also do the same things, and, uh, they can be fixed, but it's some work. So think about your futures. Think about if it's the right thing for you. Um, don't really let pain be a factor because the pain's really not an issue unless you're getting them actually sewn all the way up. Good question. Shadow Steph says, hi, love your videos and wants Thank to you. know uh, how you would advise stretching a philtrum or a labray. Is it generally the same as stretching your ears? Oh, no. You need to take more time with that one. Generally, earlobes are about six to eight weeks between each one size. Um, I used to have my sides of my lips stretched up to a six, maybe a four gauge. And the way I did that was just like every six months or so, I would get a slightly bigger and I'd see if it'd fall into place. And it actually did. I played with my jewelry all the time. I don't condone or suggest doing that because you'll do damage to your teeth, which I did. So don't do that. But it takes time before you get up to that next size. The filtrum, I've never had that stretched. There's some nerves in there. It can be a little tender. Just take your time, you know. Um, if you go to a piercer, there are some piercers, the way they stretch, where they just slam and shove the taper through really, really fast, which if it's not ready to be pierced, you just ripped and tore your piercing. So I personally suggest if you're doing the stretching with a taper, go nice and slow. So if it hurts too much, you can back off, put your normal jewelry in, and attempt again at a later time when it's a little bit more relaxed. It does take time though. Good luck. All right. Time for just a couple more questions. Right uh, viewer wants to know, can you pierce a pre-existing lobe piercing and get it up to a zero gauge? Like, like, uh, was done with Pepe in that video. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it depends on the amount of scarring inside your earlobe. So they're saying if you had like a normal earlobe piercing done with a gun or something like that, if I can re-pierce you with that. Now, the big thing is, is when you're doing a larger gauge needle, sometimes Earlobe piercing guns might be a little lower. So if I don't need to re-pierce it at a higher size, you might have that hole below it. Um, and sometimes if it's right next to it, they can kind of connect. Now, if it's in the exact right spot, I say, yeah, go for it right away. The reason we can pierce at a large size and stretch like that is because there's not really any scar tissue. But if you have this tiny little pinhole and you're doing the cut next to it, most of that is not scar tissue and that other tissue is what's going to be stretching for you. Um, I don't ever suggest like stretching a lot of sizes, like just shoving tapers through an existing hole and ripping that scar tissue. That causes problems. You can only pierce and stretch off an initial piercing. 
So yeah, super important there. But and, good question. And a good point to make here. Whoop Sloop wants to know, do you think it's a bad idea to pierce yourself in every situation? Yes. Well, not every situation. If someone said, hey, we're holding your brother hostage. If you don't pierce yourself right now, we're going to... I'm just kidding. I can't imagine that ever happening. Um, that would be the only situation I can think of, yeah, where it would be okay. Otherwise, go to a professional. I've been doing this for years and years and years. I continue my education. I'm constantly learning new things, constantly growing. The the technologies go as... I mean, we have to keep updating the different aftercare for products to be better and better and better. I don't see how someone at home could possibly do that without causing excess scarring. Uh, diseases could be spread real easily. Germs, our, our skin is super resilient and protects us all the time. It stops all the stuff from getting inside our body. And if you're just poking holes at home and not doing it clean, you're asking for problems. So don't pierce yourself at home. The only thing I would say you can do at home is going to be changing your own jewelry or possibly stretching your piercings. Otherwise, seek out a professional. All right. That was our last question for today. Again, I love doing this. Hopefully we can do it again next week at the same time, looking around noon on Wednesday. So make sure to tune in, set your alarm so you can come see me again. Thanks everyone for sending in your questions. I tried to get to as many as I can. Maybe next week we can get yours in if we didn't get it this week. So make sure to subscribe, make sure to hit that like, and of course, keep putting holes your body. We'll see you all in the next video.